Online with Richard Sandoval is a production of Hispanic Lifestyle, which is sponsored by Riverside County Economic Development Agency, which provides resource assistance for the business community. More information can be found online at rivcoeda.org. Mr. Choosing, I really want to thank you for taking this phone call, this phone interview with me, but more importantly, um, how are you and is your family safe and how are you deal, dealing with all this? Well, it's kind of funny. My wife and I um, have lived together and worked together with a home office in our two different residences for 34 years. We've been practicing. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we've been kind of joking about that. <laughs> so uh, so you do have a, uh, a plan in place for social distancing and... <laughs> we sort of, you know, know how to keep out of each other's way. <laughs> uh, as, as somebody that's married as well, I completely understand that. Yeah, um, yeah. I know that uh, I have lots of conversations with my friends about different subjects. And one of them came up about the Inland Empire and the economy. And I thought, wait a minute, I just happen to know somebody that knows a lot about this. And so my first question to you is um, our economy. I keep hearing about uh, it on pause and that we have to restart it. And I just have this vision of pushing a button and having a car start, and I really don't believe that that's exactly what's going to happen here. But maybe you can share some insights with me. Well, it, it obviously isn't. I mean, the sectors that have been hurt have been um, obviously retailing, uh, consumer services, things like hairstylists and gyms and that sort of thing, um, sit down restaurants. Uh, they've and then probably the hardest because it involves travel and large crowds, hotels and entertainment. Those sectors have a lot of people have been uh, laid off right now, and those are really the sectors we need to get restarted. Uh, there's one sort of sitting in the wings that's going to be hurt, and that is local government because of the lack of retail sales taxes coming in out of um, retail. So that's kind of where we sit now. The, the more interesting question is what's going right? And right. interestingly enough, there are one sector for sure, obviously healthcare. Um, unfortunately, healthcare is doing really well. <laughs> But the other one is the e-commerce logistics facilities. Uh, the Inland Empire going into this has been on a roll because we have so many e-commerce facilities located here. Um, Amazon alone has 14 of these 750,000 to uh, a million plus facilities cranked up wide open so do most of the other e-commerce operations. So, and obviously we're all buying on that way right now. So unfortunately it doesn't generate local retail sales taxes, but it does keep a lot of people working. Those two sectors are going to bring a lot of money to people that they really can't spend right now. So to get to the second part of your question is, how does it restart? Well, stop and think, let's take a woman that works for Amazon. Uh, she gets her paycheck, she can't get her hair done. Uh, her husband is a weightlifter, he can't lift weights. So they're kind of stuck right now. Well, when this gets starts to pull down, where we get beyond the what they call the peak of the curve and we want to get restarted, those folks are going to have money to spend. Plus, the federal government has been pouring money out to try and get it to people, so they'll have money to spend. And so once we get beyond the part where we, we have to stay at home, there's going to be a lot of money out there to spend 
and I think that will start up uh, these, con these sectors that have slowed down. What won't happen is hotel and entertainment. I don't think we'll be traveling or spending a lot of time okay. in crowds together. But when you look at retailing, you've got pent up demand all over the place. We might actually be able to get toilet paper by then. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things you brought up travel, but I've always thought, and, and of course, I don't know if this is by design, and I know a lot of it was by your encouragement, is that we are a very diverse uh, region. Our workforce, our colleges, an educated workforce, we have a blue collar workforce. I mean, again, back to the travel, the wine country, we have skiing. If you would talk about that in the sense that how diverse this whole region is. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. We have an inordinately large blue collar labor force, which is the reason why when e-commerce moved to California, we had land and we had a blue collar labor force ready to go to work, which, and it has. Uh, so that part of it uh, has been a strength for us. Uh, manufacturing is still relatively strong here. Um, we have a, an issue there in that an awful lot of people in manufacturing frankly have gray hair and are going to be retiring right. so that opens up a, a, another spot for that labor force provided we can get the skill sets to them uh, when we look at you know Coachella and a lot of the, the various festivals and things that have gone on around here they've been a real really strong I think it's going to take a while for that part to come back in terms of entertainment. I don't know how many people are going to want to go, you know, to shows, um, whether they're live or if they're, um, um, you know, just theater. Right. The movie theaters. Um, the movie theaters, because that, right. you know, that's a lot of people, though. My wife and I, when we go, we always go later than everybody else. So we're practically an empty theater, <laughs> so that would work. But um, we have a, a relatively large number of educated people, about 20 two percent of the population it is slowly moving up uh it doesn't make us competitive for large companies that need well-educated workers but it does give us a background for all the various services that you need professionals uh, to be able to do we also have companies like uh, Esri and Redlands um, that are obviously, he recruit, uh, Jack Dangerman there recruits all the way around the world. Right. Because he they're, has the, the best. I was going to say, they're a national, they are a national company or a worldwide they're, company. They're an international company. Yeah, international really. company. They lead the field in, in uh, GIS pr uh, programming and uses. So we have some of that high end, but not as much. But the, the advantage of that 22% of our labor force is they're much more likely to be able to work from home. And so they're more likely to be able to continue working in this environment. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a good thing for us. Uh, I've actually just been doing some work on Orange County and was surprised to find that Central Orange County around Anaheim, uh, Orange, Santa Ana, uh, places like that. The income levels there are almost identical to ours. I was shocked. Uh, we always see these very high numbers. Well, uh, largely that's the coast. But if you look at the center of the county, uh, we're pretty much competitive with them now, which is a, sort of an interesting fact. But anyway, getting back to your question of how do we get restarted, like I said, I think our advantages in logistics, the fact that healthcare is going strong, uh, construction is 
uh, continuing, uh, those sectors are going to power us on the outside going coming back. How fast will it be? That's a tough one. Like I said, pent-up demand, I think, is going to be crucial to that. Because if you go back to my example of the lady working at, at Amazon, she's going to want to get her hair done. This, uh, right. So, she's, a, she's been waiting on the sidelines. Yeah, she's, well, she's ready <laughs> to put that part of the economy back. Uh, my wife and I are diners. Uh, as soon as the, the restaurants open, you know, we'll be back dining. They may have fewer tables, which may be an issue for those without a lot of space. Uh, at least at the beginning, but there will be a demand for a lot of things. And I suspect there's going to be the money there to spend on it. Let me ask you this. You, you just brought up a, a great point. Demand, inventories. I mean, I, I'm not putting them on the spot. I may edit this out, but the point being Stater Brothers, I am absolutely shocked that they haven't been able to field uh, the shelves, stock the shelves, if you will, uh, with some items. And I, I don't know why with that huge distribution center that they well, have. I can tell you why they haven't got toilet paper, uh, which is, it's kind of an interesting piece of research that a reporter did and everybody's now quoting. Turns out that the, the toilet paper manufacturing sector is split into two pieces. The people that create the sort of things used in homes and the people who supply institutions. Well, if you think of the fact that institutions, a lot of them are shut down, we're all staying at home, so we're all demanding what one part of the industry uh, produces, it doesn't have the capacity because they're having to fill both uh, the demand that would have been normally from both types of, of manufacturing. Kind of an interesting issue. It is interesting. I don't know that helps my personal problems, but. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as, as, a, as a guy that travels all over the world, I always used to save my letters from home. <laughs> <laughs> Before we return to our conversation with John Husing, we would like to thank Riverside County Economic Development Agency for their support. Please visit their website, rivcoeda.org. I moved and spent about four years looking at a place that I wanted to have the next phase of my life be, and I ended up in Menifee, California. So more on a personal note, I know that we have, we didn't talk about housing yet. Our housing uh, prices have seemed to held their own. But talk about South Riverside County region. And of course, I have a, a vested interest in Menifee, California. How did I do? How am I going to do? Well, you're going to do well. I mean, Southwest Riverside County, which Menifee is now a part of, uh, with a lot of its growth coming out of uh, the San Diego area, now that Temecula and Murrieta are starting to, Temecula in particular, be built out. Uh, Elsinore, again, getting pretty built out. So a lot of that has moved to Menifee. So Menifee's been one of the real hot spots for higher end homes with uh, really strong demand and prices. Now, the demand right now obviously has fallen off just simply because I don't think a lot of us are going out home buying at the moment. But again, that's going to come back as soon as we get back into quote normal again. And Menifee will, uh, of all of the places in Riverside County, uh, it probably, there's two places that are probably the strongest. One is Menifee as part of Southwest Riverside County. The other is Eastvale, which is getting an Orange County, uh, LA County flow into what were dairies that essentially were land banked with cattle or dairy cattle that because they had a, a tax break to not develop, um, if they were willing to stay agricultural 
over a period of uh, two 10-year periods of hiatus. That then ended. The dairies pretty much left. And so you've got in South Ontario and in Eastvale, uh, these prime places for high-end real estate. And they are catering to people that are relatively well off from the coastal counties, but can't afford coastal county prices. Funny that you should mention it. Eastvale was definitely in my, my look, uh, my, my, my scope, if you will. Yeah, it's now the highest income city other than, um, oh, down where Bill Gates' father lives in uh, the Coachella Valley. Oh. Eastvale has got the highest median income in the Inland Empire. It's competitive with um, Chino Hills in San Marino County. At the end of the day, when we look back to 2000 and just 2010, and here we are in 2020, uh, what are we looking forward to as a region? Um, again, asking you to look into your crystal ball, project out to the future. What, do we, what does this you region know, look like? The fact is that whether the planners like it or not, people do not want to live in stacked buildings um, in LA and Orange County. When they have a couple of kids and a dog, they're definitely heading out this way because they have, there's no place else you can really build. Uh, at one point there was a piece of research, which I just laughed at by a, urbanist who thought he knew better saying when sprawl hits the wall the growth move out will stop and he was referring to running into the mountains well excuse me both the Coachella Valley and the high desert have over 450,000 people now but what he'd forgotten about is people will live in the desert if they can get the kind of housing they want you know, look at Las Vegas, look at Phoenix, excuse me, there was no barrier. Uh, it just basically means we go, we continue to move to where we can afford to get the kind of housing we like. And the demand is dictated by the marketplace, not by planners and politicians in Sacramento. It does take me a while during, you know, quote unquote, normal times to get from Menifee to downtown Riverside. Sure, uh, they would. So with that said, with traffic and everything else like that, with the growth expected, our infrastructure, our roads and highways, that's always been one of my biggest concerns. Well, the problem we're always going to have is catching up. I remember there was a Secretary of Transportation for Jerry Brown, when he was governor the first time, who had this brilliant idea of starving the public of road capacity to get people out of their cars. And so she decided to sell the I-210 freeway corridor so that that wouldn't be built and therefore the 10 and the 60s would stack up and we'd all decide we had to move closer to our jobs. Fortunately, we stopped her. Uh, actually, we stopped her by threatening to defund the California Transportation <laughs> Commission. And on a four to three vote, uh, her desire to sell that corridor was stopped. Thank God, because uh -oh. during the time that it wasn't built, the population went up 1.6 million in San Bernardino County without it. So, again, we're always playing catch-up, and that's going to continue to be the case. We'll be always catching up. Uh, one of the things that's always happened so far is the public has recognized it and voted yes on uh, funds to build transportation infrastructure, and I suspect they always will. Plus, it looks like the... God knows if you listen to him, if anything will actually happen. Uh, the president, together with the leaders in Congress on both sides of the aisle, appear to be talking about an infrastructure, federal infrastructure bill, which would be really helpful. 
anybody who talks about infrastructure improvements, updating our aging infrastructure always gets my attention. Well, the problem you have is the environmental laws tend to stop particularly any new projects because they're liable to huge uh, delays as people sue and sue and sue and sue to stop them for whatever reason. And until we get that under control, that really delays our keeping up with the demand that we have as population grows. And, you know, until there's a change in the, in the way in which the legislature is balanced between those who basically believe every environmental law is, you know, sanctified and those that really want to see us create jobs for the kind of people who make up a good part of our population but need construction, logistics, manufacturing, uh, in particular construction in this case, uh, we're going to just have trouble keeping up with, with the demand. The forecast was that the Inland Empire would grow to 6.1 million people from its current level, which is 4.64, if I recall correctly. Right. So that's a lot of growth. And it's more than L.A., and it's more than the combination of Orange, San Diego, Imperial, Ventura, and Santa Barbara combined. Because we've got enough. room. Yeah, we have the room. Um, putting you on the spot here, where, where again does our economy, the Inland Empire, during right before all this happened, where did we rank in, in the nation? And I, I never really quite thought about it. Where do we rank in the world? Um, as an economy, I don't have that number off the top of my head. As a population location, we rank, if we were a state, we would rank 25th. Half the states in the country are smaller than us. Half the states are larger. We are 10,000 behind Louisiana. And if, so that would put us 24th. <laughs> so when you, when you think of Senator uh, Feinstein, she represents in the Inland Empire alone as more people than half her colleagues do with their states around the country. Yeah, yeah. Which makes us a real, it's, it's why we're a long-term hotspot for growth. Uh, despite, like I said, the desire of every urban planner to stop that from happening. But I just, I think they can make all the plans they want. They can pass all the laws they want. People want to go live where they want to live. And we chose the Inland Empire. And are we still good with that word, too? Do we still like the word Inland Empire? Uh, except in the city of Riverside, pretty much, I think, yes. city of Riverside hates it. They well, want to I, change it to inland Southern California. On the other hand, then what do you do with Imperial? I, I, it's inland I, Southern California. Inland Southern, I, I, I don't know. I just know that it, it's funny when I'm on uh, trying to you know, do my business, they always ask, well, well, where do you live? And I say, well, I live in Southern California. Some people refer to it as the inland region. Oh, how far are you away from Hollywood? How far are you away from Los Angeles? And, oh, yeah. And, 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 and being in the shadow, I, I knew that. But at the end of the day, you know, it is such a beautiful region. And to do your day trips, like I said earlier, from the the uh, recreation, the food. Um, there's just it's really an so outdoor much. recreation area. I, uh, I just love the fact that you can be in the hottest place in uh, the United States and in the coldest place in the United States all within a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you can. 
I want to thank you so much for your time. It's um, my pleasure. Yeah. It's fun talking to you. Li- likewise. And uh, what, what's up next for you? I, I uh, one, Once you're allowed outside the house, so to speak, uh, what, well, what do you got coming up? We had to cancel a trip. We're really sad about it. Um, we've been together 34 years. We've been married for 30 on July 1st. And we're planning on celebrating in Champagne, Champagne in France. And uh, we had to cancel the trip because of all of this with everybody shut down. So I think we'll probably pull that back out again as soon as we can travel again. I know that I was trying to schedule something with you sometime years ago. And you said, I'm sorry, but I'm going to be in Africa. And I'm making this part up. I, were you hunting big game? I can't uh, remember, no. but I just, no, no, I no. just remember, I just remember it was something in Africa and, I, I wouldn't be available even by phone. I have been doing major adventure trips all of my life, at least all of my adult life. And so on that particular occasion, I was visiting West Africa with a um, guide who specialized in taking people into remote tribal areas to spend times with tribes who still practice their ancient religions. They're not Muslim, they're not Christian, they're not Buddhist, they're animists. And I have several times had the opportunity with him to go to really out of the way places to uh, visit folks that are fascinating to be with, with their carvings and their masks their dances, their traditions. And that's where I was uh, twice in the late 90s. Wow. Wow. I don't want to admit that I've known you that long, but <laughs> as, as always, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to talk with you. Good talking to you too, sir. Have a good day. 